on the topic of mind management we discussed that the desire for happiness is intrinsic to our soul where we decide happiness lies and contemplate it over and over again determines the direction in which our desires flow so the importance in this now is the decision of the intellect today we are going to discuss the ability of the intellect in controlling the mind this mind has the desires and the intellect has the analytical ability what is beneficial and what is harmful the mind wants immediate gratification the intellect determines whether it's good for me or not throughout the day the mind and intellect tussle with each other the mind says i want another cheeseburger the intellect says you are going to put on weight now depending on whether the mind wins or the intellect wins you indulge in it or don't do so the mind says i want to do surfing on social media the intellect says you have to prepare the report to present to the company board tomorrow now in this tussle between the mind and intellect that we all experience we repeatedly succumb to the gratificatory desires of the mind which is like a small child i want this i don't want this and this experience leads us to believe that our mind is not under our control but that is not true all of us have the ability in our intellect to control the mind if only it chooses to do so for example have you ever scolded your boss i doubt it very few people even if they do they do it with great caution because they know the consequences the boss is shouting at the subordinate you have not done your job well the subordinate says yes sir yes sir yes sir he controls the anger that is trying to burst forth in the mind but he gives vent to his anger on his subordinate that subordinate says yes sir yes sir and he releases the pent up fury upon his wife she scolds the child and the child goes and vents his anger on the dog in this way anger always flows downwards do you know why because when the intellect decides getting angry here is harmful it controls the mind don't you dare keep shut so when the intellect decides it has the ability to control the mind even a little child has that ability to help you understand such knowledge which is otherwise so vast and esoteric i have explained it simply in this recently published book the science of mind management with the help of scriptural quotations crystal clear logic and real life examples i am sure you will benefit from it so the trick in life is to utilize this power and subdue the mind until the mind is fully pure don't trust it remember it is like a little child
Live your life by the understanding of your intellect and utilize it to create the emotions in your mind that you feel are beneficial. That is why Lord Krishna refers to it in the Bhagavad Gita as Buddhi Yoga. Buddhi Yogam Pashritya Machittaha Satatam Bhavaha. He says, Arjun, what I am telling you is the yoga of the intellect. So let us delve a little deeper into this concept of the yoga of the intellect. Atma nagvam rathinam vidhi, shariram ratham evatu, buddhim tu sarathim vidhi, manah pragraham evacha, indriyani hayanahur vishayan steshu gocharan, atme indriya manoyaktam bhokte tyahur manishana. The Kathopanishad is stating that there is a chariot. It is being pulled by horses, five of them. The reins from the horses are in the hands of the driver. The passenger is sitting behind. This chariot is an analogy of the human personality, where the chariot itself represents the body. The five horses are the five senses fitted into this body. The senses are under the reins of the mind and the reins are held in the hands of the driver which is the intellect. The passenger behind is the soul. Now, ideally the passenger should convey the instruction to the charioteer. I want the chariot to be drawn to that destination. However, in this case, the passenger or the soul has gone to sleep. The soul doesn't even know that it is divine. It is confusing its identity with the body. So, because of lack of any better instruction, the charioteer is not governed by wisdom. And the horses tend to become whimsical. They tug. These are the senses. I want to see this. I want to touch this. I want to smell that, hear this. Now, the mind, because of the senses, is tugging the intellect. You know, this will give gratification. This will give happiness. I have aversion to this situation and the intellect is engaged in fulfilling the puny gratificatory desires of the mind and the senses. What is the correction? The soul needs to wake up. And the first job it has to do is to control the intellect. My dear intellect, this is the knowledge by which you need to function. Now, with the empowered intellect, we control the mind. And the mind then reigns in the senses and the chariot of the human personality moves in the desired direction to the supreme goal. So, our task then is to empower our intellect with good belief. This is the power of beliefs. Beliefs are not a creed or a religion or a sect. They are the convictions of the intellect about the reality of the world and ourselves. You may believe the world is intrinsically evil and harmful to us. You may believe Whatever happens is for the good. Somebody believes, everybody in the world is out to get me. Another person has faith, everyone has an intrinsic goodness in them. We all have established 
millions of beliefs. And through these filters of beliefs, we see the world. Because the world is so complex, we need to simplify it to understand it and handle it. And we use beliefs to comprehend the world for ourselves. These beliefs are so powerful. They exert such a tremendous force on our personality that a belief can make you sick. A belief can even kill you. Similarly, beliefs can make you well. The doctor gives you a placebo and tells you, I have given you a wonder drug. When the intellect believes it, it impacts the body. What is the placebo effect? Medical science knows very well. When the intellect is convinced that I am well, the body tends to respond. This is the impact of beliefs on our body. Imagine its impact on our actions. Imagine its consequences on our personality. That is why Henry Ford said, whether you believe you will succeed or you believe you will not, you are correct. What he meant was, if you have firm faith that you are going to make it, your physical, mental, intellectual capabilities will exert themselves to make it happen. And if your intellect is convinced this is beyond my capacities and potential, then your own latent potential will not manifest. That is the power of beliefs. And for this reason, in the spiritual pathway, beliefs can make you God-realized. Again, the Kathopanishad states that if you merely believe in the definition of God, you will attain Him. What does that mean? It means that we all know God's definition. He is all-powerful, He is the Creator, He is sitting in the heart, He is causelessly merciful, He is our eternal relative, He is the ocean of grace. We all know. But the question is, do we believe this definition? The Vedic mantra states that the day you do, He will reveal Himself to you. You don't need to do anything else. So these beliefs, are one of the biggest forces in our personality. Unfortunately, we just allow beliefs to happen to us. Like they say in America, the son of a Republican is a Republican and the son of a Democrat is a Democrat. So many beliefs, we just blindly accept and acquire them. Some through associations with friends, Sang ka rang padta hai. If friends believe that happiness is in the bottle, then the person associating with them gets the belief. But this is the big pity that this vital aspect of our personality is not being paid attention. The day we realize we have the power to choose and create our beliefs, the path to excellence will open. So, Buddhi Yoga states, the Kathopanishad states, choose your beliefs. Establish these beliefs on the basis of good knowledge. As I had stated, in the Life Transformation Challenge. Hear the knowledge of the scriptures. This is Shravanam. Then what you have heard, contemplate over it. This is Mananam. And finally, Nididhyasanam. With your intellect, decide this 
is it. When your beliefs are sound, productive, uplifting, in alignment with divine knowledge, there is no way your life cannot be auspicious. People ask me, Swamiji, why did you take sannyas? You know, you were a normal person. Then how come you got a crack in your head? So they are puzzled that how come this change took place? Was it that some disaster or tragedy struck in your life? I said, what disaster, tragedy, none that I remember. The only thing that I can remember is the knowledge that I am sharing with you. I believed it. What? That's all? Yeah. I am explaining to you that I am a part of God and happiness is in God. I believed it. How come you believed it and we are not able to believe? I don't know where that belief came from, maybe some scars of past life. But when this belief got established, taking sannyas was as easy as 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. It's the logical conclusion to my beliefs. That is why the Bible states we walk by faith and not by sight. The direction of our life is not determined by the direction of our feet, but the beliefs we have established. Now, having discussed the empowerment of the intellect with the help of beliefs, we will go even beyond to invoke divine grace. This will be in the next episode.